Chapter 10 Down the Rabbit Hole We soon landed in a wilderness. I knew it had to be to the north. It was rugged and mountainous with tall pines and heavy brush. There were paved roads, but they were few and far between. I noticed a few campsites and assumed we were at least near some national park. It was colder here, but the aroma of cedar and pines perfectly complemented the temperature. It was also getting dark, so we moved to an open area surrounded by woods and honeysuckle. The grass beneath our feet was mowed, and a path led out of the clearing, so our location was not relatively remote. Then I saw a sign that read, Panther Meadows Campground. As the sun sank in the western sky with its usual hues of purple and red, Ariel turned and said, Okay, I know you humans. You will love to explore what we are about to explore, but it is for a purpose, or we wouldn't reveal it to you. Those who will read your words won't take it seriously, so it won't affect the larger imagination. Your people prefer to live in a world without vision. We use plausible deniability to protect the larger story and the critic to develop his counter-stories. The great artist once said, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Yet he is a God that hides. If his creation see him in all his glory, they will turn to idols. Even today, after seeing the artist in Christ, they have turned to statues and icons rather than the true artist. They even pray and light candles for other humans who saw the image of the invisible God millennia ago. Your imagination will hide you from him. You will worship the image instead of the one who creates all images. You will not have the intimacy he wishes for his creation unless God hides. God hides his spirit in those he has chosen and redeemed. However, you will see him one day after you have learned. I interjected. One of the greatest frustrations in my former life was the hiddenness of God. Why doesn't he just come out and reveal himself? Yes, she said with a demeanor of sympathy. When the artist entered his story, his image, others wanted the same thing. Tell us if you are the Christ, they demanded. Another time they complained about keeping them in suspense and wanted him to tell them plainly. Each time the artist told them, they still would not believe it. Even now a wild-haired human is promoting that aliens, mere creations, are the gods you worship. His blasphemies are the root of the critic's newest attempt at subverting the grand story. There is no god of the Bible for this new story, only aliens or the simulation programmer. If Christ came immediately, the critic would use people like him to announce an invading alien force and round up his allies in the nations to fight against him. If you are willing to accept it, the desolation of abomination, the man of deceit, will use artificial intelligence to manipulate and control many nations. Its inventor is the beast leading international council, and the AI will be their weapon. Okay, you sound like a conspiracy theorist, I said half-jokingly. There is a percentage it may not happen. The critic has been practicing for generations. He came closest to the reign of Adolf Hitler, but we defeated him. The critic doesn't have the power of God's imagination. He can only distort, deceive, and pervert you humans to manipulate the grand story. His power is limited, so he must find a way for his evil offspring to perform miracles and sound wise. He has been conniving to outdo the artist with his story, but he must manipulate worldviews to do it. Now he is trying to create a new religion based on an interpretation of science from which he can introduce himself as a god. I just heard a knock in the forest like wood on wood that startled me. Follow the sound of the knocks, Ariel commanded. Aren't you leading me? I asked with some concern. No, she replied. These beings can see me unless the spirit hides me. Providence has decided. You must go. Why me? I continued. Because you are not embodied. You exist only in the divine imagination. Since we flow with the information, you are perfectly camouflaged, she explained, putting her hand on my shoulder as if to reassure me. Remember, God cannot forget. You exist only in the mind of your father until your glorification with him. Your reality is a reality of memory. 
The people you will see are in the story. You are in between. Ariel pulled two objects from one of her pouches attached to her belt. It was a ring and a glove. Then she explained. Just as the shoes I gave you function as an interface with the story, so these will help you. Whatever else you may need, the Holy Spirit will give you. The ring lets you understand the unknown tongues of the people you will see. The glove allows you to pick up or move objects. Be careful to hide them as they will be able to see them. If your glove is grasped, you will be too. Otherwise, they will neither see you nor be able to touch you. The ring was gold with some writing on it. I asked, What is this written on the ring? It is one of God's seals, she told me. The glove was tight-fitting and almost translucent, not something I thought would be helpful. Don't worry, she reassured. As long as you hide it behind you or in a pocket, it cannot be seen. You should not need it anyway. Then a knock was heard again deep in the brush. What's with the knocks, and why follow them? I asked the obvious question. She told me that the knocking of wood, crashing of trees, and even the pitching of rocks were used to spook us humans and simultaneously let the group know that humans were nearby. No humans dare to go in the direction of the sounds, but I will have to because it will give me directions to my destination. So down the rabbit hole I went. I listened for the sounds, confident that no one could see me. However, it evened out because I couldn't see well either. It was pitch black. I wondered if the people I was looking for preferred such nights. My people would prefer a full moon. I would walk a few hundred yards and hear a knock, sometimes a human-like whoop. Then, as Ariel instructed, I would adjust my azimuth. I thought I would have more fear, but being unreal can give you confidence. I could feel the story beneath my feet with its rubble, undergrowth, and the occasional draws but I never stumbled. This movement and waiting went on for a couple of hours. I imagined it was nearly midnight since we landed in the clearing at sunset. The stars were shown clearly, but served little at being a light to my feet. Eventually, I reached a small clearing near the timber line of the mountain. It was still dark, of course, but I could still make out a circle of figures standing or sitting. There were two concentric circles of figures. The inner circle had very tall, hulking silhouettes. They were sitting on the ground with large logs. The outer ring held individuals who seemed to out-dark the night. They wore flat-brimmed hats, but their eyes pierced the darkness with glaring red. A few figures mingled in and out of the trees surrounding the clearing as if keeping watch. Some of those looked more like bipedal dogs than those in the circle. They were a bit scarier in appearance. As they sniffed the air, one of them looked in my direction. I found a gully and a rock to settle down to watch the developing spectacle away from any figures milling around the periphery, but close enough to the center to hear them. Occasionally I would forget they could not see me anyway unless I revealed the glove hidden in my coat like a portrait of Napoleon. Suddenly, without warning, one of the hulking creatures let out a thunderous screech. I assumed that if I were still in the throes of the story, it would have caused me to wet my pants. It was horrifically loud on the one hand, but intense on the other, like infrasound. The ground vibrated, even the rock I was sitting on. The outburst seemed counterproductive for a group that wished to remain secret. Again, as Ariel suggested, few humans would run toward the sound I heard. Someone, or something, spoke from the center of the circle of what I estimated to be thirty-six beings. I could hear the foreign language, but the ring worked. I could mentally translate. Greetings to you all. We are the local Mata Kagmi, the Tata Klea, associated with the League of Moloch and the Gilyuk. Have news to report, the individual told the crowd. After this, the shadow figures began to rub crystals together up and down. As they did, they made a dark, greenish light that better illuminated the circle. Now I could see the large figures were ape-like. You may be thinking what I thought at that moment and already suspected. These were the legendary Bigfoot. Ariel was very right. I was deep in the rabbit hole. The figures creating the eerie green glow, however, remained dark. I could still see the outline of their stature and the clear rims of their hats. 
This was a fantastic and unbelievable scene for human appreciation, but in the green limelight stood a human figure, or at least what seemed to be human, sitting in a wooden chair. He was dressed in a black business suit with a briefcase leaning up against the legs of his chair. He wore a hat like the shadow creatures, but I could see it. He looked pale, but then again, the green tint of everything could make anyone look pale. One of the Bigfoots stood up, and only then did I realize how big these creatures were. He was at least nine feet tall. From what I could tell in the light, he had reddish black hair but had a gray or white goatee on his chin. His face looked ape-like and his eyes were dark. He spoke with an alternating high pitch and low pitch voice. Brothers, he began, you know that we have honored the treaty with the Watchers for thousands of years. A few of us disturb the humans from time to time, and a few have feasted on some culled from their herds. Yet we have remained faithful to keep ourselves hidden until the day arrives. We have even avoided fire moving from place to place with our mates and offspring. Yet these humans continue to make it harder and harder with their machines. With the help of the Watchers, we have kept ourselves from their eyes. They may have their stories, but few believe them. Now, we are reaching a critical point. Even the Watchers and their possessions in human agencies like the CIA and FBI struggle to keep the treaty. Every human can record us, and their numbers encroach into our refugees. The human military has also killed great numbers of us. He turned to the right, moved to the center of the assembly and raised his fist. Now, our father is moving his story toward our revelation. He further looks to humiliate us by calling us aliens or extraterrestrials. What does that even mean? Do we not know what lies above the canvas? I have heard the humans talk here at our mountain of meeting of other creatures unknown to us, but are said to be us. It makes no sense. Yet, we have helped the Son of the Morning by keeping the treaty for thousands of years, and the Watchers have ensured that privacy for those thousands of years. I entreat you, brothers. This upheaval should not be. At that sentence, the creatures stomped their feet, shaking the ground. One plain representative with jet-black hair interjected. We, the Kushtaka, concur and will refuse to reveal ourselves. Our possessions have a delicate arrangement with us that we wish not to ruin. They leave offerings, and in return, we do not eat them. The local Matakagmi nodded and continued. We have the devil's representative here to address this issue and our distaste for this historical redirection. The representative of the Tata Keli Ah rose with an objection. No one from the Bohemian Grove has sent us word about this break of the protocol. We object. Moloch and Ashtoreth are being supplanted, the creature at the center responded bluntly, and to the audible gasp of the group. The great Bial is losing his possessions as many turn away from his craving for sacrifice. He is being dethroned. Lucifer himself is coming to write a new story. Even now, a great delusion is sweeping the territory in preparation for his glory. Moloch is being sent to Birmingham in the Commonwealth to re-establish his reign. Another in the crowd, much smaller than the rest and pale in color, asked loudly, We are the Moon-Eyed. We have spread among the natives. We too have no idea of any of this. As I listened, I thought how bizarre this was. The ring translated the words, but not the context. What was the treaty? The Watchers? these various tribes of Bigfoot, aliens, and this special guest. For the first time, I doubted this reality. As Hamlet said to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt in your philosophy. Hamlet 1, 5.167. The speaker continued, One of the Watcher representatives is here to talk to us. I hope he has a good explanation for changing the treaty. At that point, the creature nodded to the well-dressed figure with the briefcase. The man stood, picked up the briefcase, and moved to the center. With a stone-faced look, he began, Ancient ones, my lord has commanded that you be released from your treaty. You are not bound to remain hidden, for he is developing a story to overshadow the grand artist. As you have alluded, our father below has been developing a story to fool his possessions. 
Already the Watchers have released evidence to the possessions of what they think are alien spacecraft. He did some air quotes for alien, but I got the sense they didn't understand. Instead of our demon cousins in their chariots, we have led them to believe they are people from the stars. The giant creatures murmured among themselves with evident displeasure. The man motioned for the crowd to settle down and continued, Those of you educated in our war with the enemy know that a battle is brewing. Our father below wants to fool the humans, so they will not recognize the enemy's coming. He has been working on this for nearly two hundred years now. This requires your obedience, as one of your numbers will be recorded. If you do not comply, we will manufacture it anyway. The humans are on their way to scientific superstition as our father below wishes. If it is couched as science, the possessions will believe anything. At this point, the man smirked slightly and sat his briefcase on the ground. He opened it up, and a reddish hologram arose from its base. It was a figure of an angel sitting on a throne. His eyes scanned the crowd with a scowl. Next, the apparition spoke, I am the god of this world. You will follow my commands or I will come and strike you down when I arrive in your world. I am not patient. My enemy pressures me on every side, but I have control of the narrative, not him. I am working on releasing the dragon of my hate and the beast of my glory upon the nations. They will have nothing and be happy. I will make my story greater than the enemy and make myself their god. Stand in my way, and I will destroy you. At this last word, the hologram blinked off, and the man closed the briefcase. He carried the case back to his seat. The creatures were seething. I could see it on their faces, even with the green hue. The creature that first spoke stood and said to them, The Watcher representative will leave this briefcase with us to hold us leaders accountable. We are to wait here at this mountain for three and a half years. We are to open the case every full moon to receive his preparatory instructions. Understood. The creatures stood up, talking among themselves. The meeting stood adjourned. One creature who introduced himself as Cyrus called to the man in the suit. We have some questions. The man walked over to the creatures and was dwarfed by them. He showed no fear, however, in his conversation with them. He even pointed at them as if scolding them. It was at that moment that inspiration struck. The briefcase by the chair sat unattended. I am unseen. I have the glove to ensure interaction with the world. What if I snatched away the case and brought it to Ariel? The case was only meters away. Without the case, the creatures would be in the dark. Perhaps this would hinder the evil one's plans to use them to further his narrative. Either way, the angels could use this briefcase to hunt down Lucifer himself.